Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans, and if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, Gratuitous, and Monero. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source, and you always control your own keys. And by Sweetwater Digital Asset Consulting, connecting new money with old money since 2018. Cake Wallet and Sweetwater Digital are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Jiraj Benar, an entrepreneur, hacker, and explorer with a passion for increasing liberty in his and others' lives, most famously through his co-founding of Parallelna Police. Jiraj is an early Bitcoiner and Monero enthusiast who has a deep understanding of the true purpose of cryptocurrency which he discusses in his podcasts and blogs. In this episode, Doug and Jaraj talk about many Bitcoin and Monero related topics, but focus mainly on his blog titled, How Could Regulators Successfully Introduce Bitcoin Censorship and Other Dystopias? Monero Talk starts now. All right. Thank you so much, man. Once again, thanks again for for doing this. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like you said, uh, I guess it's, it's it's better to do it today, right? After breaking a Monero all time high, so it's yeah, yeah. It's, we're we're all happy. Unfortunately, not in Bitcoin terms, but in fiat terms, uh, at least uh, we have all time high. So good, and I feel that the last few days have been very interesting. The censoring pool, uh, the OFAC. Uh, can I can I call it O oh, fuck? <laughs> no, <laughs> o F A C. <laughs> yes. I don't I don't know how you pronounce it. Uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But I I like O O oh, fuck better. That that that's perhaps more appropriate. <laughs> well, yeah. what is it? we'll we'll get into that. Uh, maybe that's a good place to start. What is your take on that? On this development? Um. Well. It was expected, I would say, and uh, I think there are companies that want to signal that they're uh, compliant, maybe too over compliant. So maybe we should explain what it means first uh, for those th- that don't know. Uh, yeah. Yesterday, there was a, um, a pretty uh, normal Bitcoin block mined uh, uh, with one exception. It had uh, a message in its op return, which is just a string that someone uh, put there, uh, the the mining pool, um, and the string said that it it is uh, compliant with uh, O O F A C or as we call it O F A C sanction list. Uh, so uh, that's some uh, U.S. Uh, office for financial something i don't know what what it stands for i I forgot Uh, but it's basically a governmental organization that um, puts together uh, sanction lists for uh, for uh, uh, people companies and countries if i understand it correctly and recent recently they've been publishing publishing also a list of um, uh, different crypto addresses like bitcoin addresses uh, usually part of uh, some stolen funds or some known money launder or uh, um, whoever the government finds uh, criminal or dangerous or anything like that. Uh, so this only means that uh, that there's uh, there's a mining pool that wants to show everyone and probably especially the regulators that they will not mine any transactions that are using these sanctioned coins what it really means who knows <laughs> uh, do we, because do we know anything yeah. about, or do you know anything about this mining pool where they're located i i, I haven't done no. any research 
and seeing the, the two I haven't uh, I haven't either uh, there was another uh mining pool which is called Bloxier uh which is I believe different than this one this is this this was called something else and that one uh, also publicly announced that they're going to uh, enforce uh, this kind of uh, anti-money laundering censorship. They didn't put it in the OB return as far as I know, but this one is definitely based in the US, the blocks here, the, the, the other one. So uh, it's kind of uh, a pattern. <laughs> and blocks here is the one you referenced in your blog post. Yes. Uh, you yes. basically describe a scenario wherein we can perhaps really start to see the effect that these OFAC regulations, uh, you know, other regulations that are coming down, uh, how it could potentially start to lead to censorship. Uh, yes. the, the miners start to comply. Uh, and, you know, it's no longer theoretical at this point, right? We're, we're seeing, uh, essentially what you proposed in your blog we're starting to see it happen is that is that yeah, fair to say? yeah i would you say uh i think uh right now it is just uh, showing off that it is possible that there are some um uh some mining pools that uh, kind of uh, went the harder way implemented these uh, these censorship lists and they are kind of showing that it's possible so that's the first step because right now it's okay anyone can mine whatever they want uh but we see that there are some pools that uh, that took the effort maybe they want uh, to uh, get some tax cut maybe they want to uh, i don't know get access to cheap energy so they are kind of signaling maybe maybe they uh, want to um sell the the coin rewards otc to institutional investors that care about these things maybe they they even declare that it's whatever renew, renewable energy or something like that but once we see that it's possible uh i think that people will start or regulators will start asking okay now it's possible why is not everyone doing it why just you know these two pools why um why not uh, you know stop these evil money launderers and uh, kind of uh create a soft fork uh, where all this is uh, being enforced. And um, I think Bit Bitcoiners um, are a little bit uh, underestimating uh, uh, the regulations uh, and, uh, and actually how it works. Because uh, one thing that is very interesting is that uh, the the world of financial transfers uh, has changed in the last 20 years definitely 20 years ago the story was uh, we are a bank uh, you can you know whisper to us uh, we will never ever tell anyone about uh, what kind of money you have where it comes from uh, of course if we see that uh, you are whatever, selling drugs or something, we have to notify the police. But the story back then was banking secrecy and uh, your money is your business and we just take care of it. And if you look at it, how it changed in the past 20 years, uh, there are two interesting things uh, about this. First one is um, that it didn't actually, um, uh, didn't actually happen based on country or state regulations these were all first private regulations i can explain what it means and we are seeing this in uh, in crypto so one thing that bitcoiners uh, are especially missing is they are expecting this regulation to come from us or china and they, they they think okay who is going to introduce it first why what would the other party do and and so on uh, but the thing with uh, anti-money laundering regulation is that they are global they're exactly or almost exactly the same in the whole world and that is because uh, of network effects and of uh, uh, because of an organization called uh, fatfa gafi financial action task force we have seen some uh, some regulations in crypto so uh, ma made by fatfa gafi so the so the crypto traveler rule and all all these uh, things come from uh, from fatfa gafi and this organization What's crazy, sorry to interrupt. Uh, yeah, yeah. Crazy. I mean, it's we're talking about a small, small group 
of people essentially at the end of the day that yeah. are creating this policy, uh, which exactly. is being adopted by you know the the largest states governments around the world without essentially yeah. without even even ones that are competing like if you want to be currently connected to any kind of payment you basically have to comply so uh, you know people say okay there will be some uh, free states like singapore and hong kong and they don't care no if they want to send us dollars they comply as everyone else otherwise they don't have a corresponding bank agreements and they're out of the financial system basically so this is one interesting thing uh, these regulations are actually called recommendations uh, and uh, if you want to get connected uh the other bank or other financial institution um uh, that you are creating this relationship with um uh, asks you okay so what is your anti-money laundering policy and of course the easiest thing to say uh, the same as everyone's we comply with these recommendations by fat for uh so uh so basically uh it's uh uh well uh, a financial institution that doesn't have connectivity to the banking system uh, is useless. You know, you can put your gold in a vault, but uh, as far as any kind of payment interactions go, you need to be connected. So there is no way around these regulations. Um, so people say, okay, the US, you know, the regulators are more friendly or, you know, Wyoming, uh, we like the, uh, you know, Wyoming uh, state government likes uh, Bitcoin, so it's all good. No, <laughs> you know, Wyoming bank uh, complies with the, with the same FATFA regulations. So uh, I would say that uh, if, you, if you compare uh, the situation 20 years ago and now, uh, you see all these anti-money laundering, uh, reporting, compliance stuff already implemented. And uh, back to miners, miners and, uh, uh, and uh, 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 exchanges and everyone else, they also want to be connected uh, to this financial infrastructure. Why? You have a large data center, you want to mine Bitcoin. Uh, what do you do okay you need to uh, find uh, some venture capital to uh, finance the capital you need uh, to find a good relationship with uh, with energy providers you need to buy uh, uh, air conditioning and so on and you need to pay your bills every month for or uh, every two weeks for for the for for the electricity so mining is actually a very tight margin business very capital intensive which is good uh, because of the security it's uh, much safer than uh, than proof of stake when uh, you can you know uh, borrow a lot of capital take over the network and then uh, you know it's yours here you need to really pay a lot of money up front and uh, with mining you uh, you need to uh, keep the capital invested in order to sustain that the the attack so so proof of work is in my opinion much better but these people they want to sell their bitcoin on an exchange they want to wire money every month to the electricity company they're not you know rebels with uh, you know asic minder miners under the table in the kitchen that's it's no longer <laughs> 2012 you know this is not happening it's really um kind of I, I consider personally miners uh, the most conservative part of uh, of crypto infrastructure. They're really tight margins, you know, uh, get the job done and uh, and that's it. Right. It's, it's, so, just, not, it's just not possible for them. Uh, they wouldn't be able to s sustain themselves if they weren't connected to the traditional banking system, right? Because they, they need the, you know, like you said, they at the end of the day, they need to um whatever it is maybe sell sell their bitcoins and they need to keep the lights yes. on they need to keep the electricity running yes yes that 
and also uh, you know it's a large building or a large set of shipping containers uh, under a state you know it's not uh, maybe you remember the pictures of m miners mining and police thinking it's weed you know because there was snow melting on the roof yeah. uh, you know that that's not happening you know the a mining business is a huge data center with uh, racks full of miners so it's uh, you're not going to hide so if you are uh, you know openly against uh, sanctions or you are um, you are uh, willingly uh, going to mine uh, some sanctioned transactions uh, you eventually uh, need to interact with the regulator it's not happening now so that's that's the good part uh, but what I'm saying is um, imagine uh, uh, I I wrote a blog about one kind of attack, but we can simplify it and make it hardcore and and see where the problem is. So imagine you are a miner and uh, you mine um, a transaction that originates in these sanctioned coins. Uh, by the way, it can be an address, but uh, it can also be uh, uh, for for the US, it can be maybe coins originating in sanctioned card countries, so North Korea or Iran. You know, if they can say, okay, these coins come from North Korea, they are automatically banned. You know, it's uh, do not touch. So let's say there's a miner uh, that mines this transaction, you know, allows them to send these coins to um, wherever, to another address. Uh, you cannot send it to a, to a large exchange, even today. Uh, chain analysis flags it and uh, goodbye. Uh, this transaction is uh, uh, is definitely not allowed. That's why people who stole money from Bitfinex and so on uh, they they can cannot cash out. You know that there was there was a tweet about uh, about the coins moving, but it doesn't doesn't mean that they they were able to cash it out. You know it's a, a what seven and a half billion US dollars worth of Bitcoin right now and someone has this huge pile of money and they cannot do anything with it today without any uh, censorship um, uh, on the on the side of of miners they just cannot right uh, even sell, sell it on any censorship right yes it's already useless essentially it's they can't Unt until atomic yeah. blocks comes around i guess for between bitcoin and monero maybe, maybe that would uh give them yeah, a chance. yeah. well okay, uh, it's a uh, yeah, we can we can talk about it. I I think it's a uh, it it is going to be a problem uh, from from many perspectives, um, but um, uh, right now uh, in many countries there are laws that you cannot uh, use proceeds uh, from money laundering. You know, it's you know if if you are a bank and you launder money and you take five percent that 5% is also dirty money. Mm -hmm. So let's say that the OFAC comes and says, OK, uh, you see that it is possible to mine clean blocks. There are two mining pools that are already doing it. Please ask them, install their software. And for everyone else, uh, if you people uh, mine uh, any, um, uh, any of these uh, dirty transactions, uh, your block reward, which is essentially proceeds from criminal activity, because you are uh, you are uh, earning fees on transacting with dirty money. Uh, I'm making air quotes now because <laughs> uh, I don't think there is such a thing as uh, as dirty money in this sense. Um, that means that your whole block reward you know 6.25 bitcoin plus all the transaction fees is going on a blacklist so you cannot send it to an exchange any other miner that would uh, allow you to mine a transaction um, happens to uh, to have the same problem because now uh, your block reward is dirty money so uh, you cannot use it because no other miner would touch it it's on the list and uh, uh, and your reward becomes unusable so uh, what do you do as a miner you have uh, whatever uh, they can pay ten thousand dollars in bitcoin 
for mining that transaction what do you want more 6.25 uh bitcoin in block reward or uh some <laughs> some scrap uh from from the transaction fee so the only way how you could move this money is by overpaying way more than all the other transaction fees and all the other rewards maybe then you would convince the miner okay i i don't care about my 6.25 bitcoin because my block reward will be 20 bitcoin and then i will take care of this problem myself but now they have the same problem as the as the original uh, original guy because uh, uh, now they cannot move their money they need to overpay or they mine their own block and so on and as essentially this bitcoin is not usable on any kind of exchange so uh, what you can do with it uh, that's maybe uh, maybe what I what I wanted to say with uh, with atomic swaps and so on uh, well you can transfer this problem to someone else uh, you can uh, coin join with Wasabi or Samurai Wallet, which means uh, uh, ruining the day for everyone else who is in the coin join round, which is the first problem. The second problem is uh, you will not do this with 20 Bitcoin. You know, it's uh, obvious that uh, the majority of the outputs are yours. So it's not really a coin join because there's not, not enough liquidity in the coin join. So, uh, CoinJoin, I would say, will be also marked uh, as tainted because most of it is, again, dirty money. Second thing you can do is atomic swap with, with Monero. But if I was not insane <laughs> and I was the provider of, of this Monero, I would want to see the, the UTXO that uh, the other party is trading, which they will show me, of course. And I will check it against the list because I don't want, uh, you know, 20 Bitcoin of dirty money that I cannot send uh, because they're they're censored. So I I would I wouldn't say that uh, that this actually solves the problem at all because uh, even you know us who value fungibility, you know, like uh, privacy and so on, uh, uh, people who are fans of Monero. Uh, we would not take a dirty Bitcoin and give our uh, nice, clean, fungible Monero for it. That's insane. Of course, uh, details matter. You know, exchange rate can be very different, and and so on. But but then you have the problem with uh, with uh, dirty coins. The third thing that you could do, and uh, I predict that uh, this will also uh, also happen soon. The third thing that you can do is open a Lightning channel. Uh, with these coins and basically loop the coins out. So Lightning is pretty good, it's private, uh, it's uh, quite secure, it works today. Uh, but what would you do? Uh, you go to a large liquidity provider, you open a channel with, with them, say Alan Beek or any of these uh, larger providers, um, and you basically uh, send the coins to Lightning Network to your different node with different UTXOs. So you can buy incoming uh, liquidity and you basically use Lightning Network to pass this dirty UTXO to the uh, to the liquidity provider, to, to the other side of the channel and receive clean coins on the other side. Today you can do it and this is a very, very easy way to mix your money. Uh, you can even close the channel, channel, or you can, you know, just turn off the node and uh, nev never let it talk on the network again. And someone else uh, ends up uh, with a with a dirty UTXO. So, uh, what I believe is that when people uh, start opening channels with us, we will also install blacklists on our Lightning nodes because we don't want the dirty coins because they're not usable. So uh, this tiny thing, uh, one country uh, that has kind of authority or organization like FATFA starting creating these lists of dirty coins and adding block rewards of miners uh, in, in there, they basically enforce censorship and none of the solutions work. You cannot coin join, you cannot atomic swap with, with Monero and you cannot... Uh, um, mix it with lightning because all three 
uh, options will at some point install these uh, uh, these blacklists as well because they're they're not insane and they're not uh, uh, giving you the uh, clean coins uh, in uh, in in exchange for dirty coins or tainting their their inputs. So uh, it's my kind of my dark vision. I still hope that it doesn't happen. <laughs> um, but uh, we are seeing uh, seeing these things such as these two two mining pool censoring transactions. So so it's kind of going in the uh, in the direction. Maybe uh, maybe it is just signaling maybe they uh they will not be successful i don't know uh but this is currently technically feasible uh way uh way to enforce censorship on on bitcoin i think yeah it's kind of, it's kind of scary um i mean it's what people in the monero community i think have been screaming about for for a long time and now it's coming to fruition what do you think lightning nodes might be considered uh you know money transmitters so people running nodes do you see that as a potential concern or not so much well it could definitely happen uh the regulators are crazy so uh <laughs> other thing um you know we okay i'm a crypto anarchist i i i am in this because i value censorship resistance privacy fungibility hard money as well i that's why i like bitcoin i'm not against bitcoin i own bitcoin um but uh we are kind of you know uh in this uh mindset that you know we are the the cool guys we have all this tech that can circumvent all these you know censorship and we are successful in many things so for example uh hard money and uh you know uh, kind of counterbalance of the printing presses right now it's very good that we have bitcoin that we have monero and that we can ac actually do it and it's amazing because it's been a crypto anarchist dream since the 90s basically uh but the problem is um uh, that we kind of think of the old world of the traditional financial system as uh totally stupid people that don't get what's going on and and so on but imagine for the past 20 years these guys have been at least uh trying to do everything uh, possible to uh to create financial surveillance and uh, and to stop money laundering and to introduce um, uh, tax reporting for for balances and so on so fatca crs all these things are already in place they are already happening and now someone creates um, a technological invention uh, called uh, bitcoin uh, uh, like the first and the largest one um, and now you know everyone is expecting this guy saying okay so we wasted 20 years of our lives you know it's not going to work uh, you won <laughs> you know <laughs> good luck uh, please launder money don't be evil and uh, we don't we cannot do anything we, about it you know we give up <laughs> you know do you see this happening uh, just the just the uh, compliance costs of uh, um, of banks uh, for AML are whatever uh, in in billions of dollars per year, so uh, so um, even you know even if you are not talking about regulators and FATFA, you know uh, you have uh, you have banks there uh, hiring hundreds of people in compliance. You know they're asking uh, people about their credit card transactions and why did you wire money to Panama? Why uh, why do you have a bank account in Switzerland? And you know show me your ta tax return. I want to see if this money is clean. So they're wasting all this time, and now there's competition essentially to their business, and they don't have to do anything. You know do do you think that these banks will not push totally crazily for at least the exact amount of compliance i don't think so they're they're um, um they're going to do it so uh so um yeah what it, what is i think going to happen is the banks will put push exchanges exchanges want to have connectivity to the 
fiat system because they're uh, making their profit uh, from fees from volume uh, and uh, uh, that means that exchanges will enforce compliance uh, to everyone and maybe maybe uh, someone will say okay let's uh, add this layer of minor compliance to chain analysis databases and uh, and we have censorship and uh, uh, I hope that it doesn't happen, but it doesn't mean that, you know, these guys are just going to sit down, uh, you know, hands crossed and uh, looking at us and <laughs> saying, okay, guys, you won, you have uh, your cool blockchain invention and we cannot do anything about it. It's like, I, I don't get it. It's it's so naive, I think. Yeah, I <clears throat> couldn't possibly agree with you more. Um, so what... What do you think Bitcoin becomes or, or what is it if it hasn't become that already? I mean, you know, the white paper was uh, the title was what a peer to peer transaction system, right? Digital cash. Transaction. Electronic cash. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Cash um, and then, you know, over time, it's it's kind of the, the meme for Bitcoin has pivoted into just purely being a, a store of value, digital yeah. gold. And now it appears to be even less digital gold like and more just like property. You know, there's uh, yeah. 21 million parcels. You can own a piece of it. It's completely transparent. You can know who owns it. You can see it moving around, but it's going to have value because we all say it has value. Is that what Bitcoin becomes? And it's just, uh, you know, just this purely a uh, store of value system, not really going to be used for censorship resistance, not going to be used as digital cash. What, what do you see Bitcoin becoming? Uh, so I think that uh, it definitely will be more of a store of value than peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash. Uh, I think it will be a store of value um, for institutional investors a lot so a lot of companies are going to start buying bitcoin because of the hard cap and because they can have uh, this piece of property so exactly like you like you said it and and it's uh, uh, i think it's a good value proposition uh, why, I, why not dogecoin at that point see that that's my concern with this uh, i i can answer that i i, I think right. that they have a really good case uh, case for this. And uh, um, the reason is that the Bitcoin community is super conservative. So basically you ask any question, hey guys, maybe can we implement this? And the answer is always no, you know, even with Taproot, it's, uh, you know, they're, they're talking about it, they're activating it, you know, you, they need 90% minor support and so on. But until then, the answer is always no. And, you know, I, I am personally pretty sure that if uh, someone comes and says, okay, let's increase the hard cap not to 21 million because the transaction fees make it unsustainable to mine or something like that, uh, they will be just laughed out of the room. Like there's not going to be even a discussion. With other coins, for example, with Ethereum, you know, how many times they, they changed, uh, you know, now they're changing, um, uh, changing the transaction fees, how they work, how the rewards for miners work, then they're going to switch to proof of stake and so on. So uh, this this dynamic um, uh, kind of development uh, doesn't make it a good store of value because it all depends on what is, uh, you know, Vitalik and uh, five uh, Twitter influencers are going to think about it in one year. You know, they write a paper, they create a new model, and then suddenly they uh, their macroeconomic calculation says, okay, now we have to increase it or something like that. So I think they have a like this stubbornness and this uh, total refusal uh, of uh, any changes, uh, especially hard forks. Uh, I think uh, this makes it a uh, very good store of value. And uh, I don't see this in uh, in anything else. Even in Monero, you have scheduled hard forks and, uh, you know, uh, you either go with it or your coins have no value because the other chain, you know, there was a Monero classic or original or something and just went down to zero. So uh, 
I think this has kind of uh, kind of good uh, value proposition that uh, that we are not expecting regular hard, hard forks. We are not expecting any changes in the protocol, and you can be fairly sure that uh, you know it's at most 21 million you know some of the coins might be frozen so it might be even less because of this censorship uh but i am personally pretty sure that they're not going to mess with the supply in any way on the other hand uh as you correctly said the use case of uh, uh of payments is not as nice as, as it used to be uh censorship you know people are asking okay what kind of utxo i'm going to get will i have problems with it and so on i really like lightning i i really like uh, where they're going with it and uh, it uh, has fungibility uh, and what I think might happen that will make it more useful than it is right now, I wrote a blog about it, um, is uh, basically building bridges uh, and uh, kind of expanding uh, the Lightning Network out of the Bitcoin blockchain. So just to give you an example, uh, you, have, uh, uh, you have a liquid, which is a side chain made by Blockstream. Uh, it even has some... Uh, nicer privacy features it has confidential transactions so you don't see amounts um, it's mined by a federation so basically it's a proof of authority it's not uh, super decentralized but it's not controlled by one entity either and there you have low fees and the base coin is still bitcoin uh, you can run bitcoin script on it so it has this uh, simple smart contract capabilities so you can actually run lightning on it there is even a c lightning implementation that runs on top of liquid now because you have uh, uh, the same protocol very similar um, underlying backing you can create bridge so you can create a vir virtual channel that is not backed on either side uh, so uh, so there are just two nodes that trust each other uh, so they can both be my nodes i can have one node uh, that is running on top of liquid another node that is uh, running on top of bitcoin and I say, as, as owner of these two nodes, I don't care about the balance between these two nodes because they're both mine. So if people send me money on Liquid, I am okay to send money that are backed by Bitcoin on chain and, and the other way around as well. What this allows you to do is you can have one Lightning Network that is not uh, backed uh, purely by Bitcoin blockchain. It can be backed by other chains uh, because there are these bridges that uh, that want to make routing fees. So I think this will make it much more uh, useful payment network. Uh, the fees will get lower. Uh, it will have even a little bit more privacy uh, on the uh, on-chain layer, basically. Uh, because of things like confidential transactions or you can have some other privacy features on, on this chain and it can still be one network. So what you, what you can do is you can, uh, for example, I run an eShop. Uh, I want to receive Bitcoin. I say, okay, I don't care about this, uh, you know, liquid corporate side chain. I, I don't trust it. I open my channels on the real bitcoin blockchain for example i buy liquidity from someone else they open channels to me and i can receive bitcoin you on the other hand you don't care you want to uh, you know pay uh, up to a thousand dollars you don't want to pay twenty dollars for a transaction fee for bitcoin on chain and you know it's pocket money so you open a channel on liquid so that is backed by uh, by this side chain and you can pay me. So I receive my Bitcoin that are backed on Bitcoin chain. Uh, you send me liquid coins and it's all atomic, all one network. You don't even notice that uh, that it didn't originate on the, on, on the same chain. So I think that this can be used and Lightning is quite good uh, uh, in this regard. So, and what I think will happen with uh, Monero. So that's another good question. I believe that uh, Monero will be purely black market money. 
I think that most countries, in some countries, it's essentially banned today. It's still used, but uh, you know what you're getting into, you know. So if you are in that country, uh, you have Monero, you know it's banned, you, there's no uncertainty about, uh, you know, what kind of UTXO it is, nothing. You know you have Monero and you know what your situation is. You know, okay, does this exchange take my Monero or 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 it doesn't you know you read the reviews and uh, you don't uh, you don't basically care that the beauty of fungibility uh, stays but i think that in many uh, many places it will be de facto banned for example i live in slovakia uh, which is in uh, european union and uh, so we have all these aml5 and uh, other uh, aml6 is being prepared uh, these regulations uh, you know if you do anything with crypto you need a special license and so on so it's becoming difficult but what we have in slovakia uh, we have a lot of uh, bitcoin atms all around uh, a lot of meaning i uh, in the capital there are maybe eight of them or, or uh, something like that so um, quite uh, uh, quite a large number a city of less than half million people uh, we have very low fees um, but the problem is uh, we were able to buy Monero uh, we were able to sell Monero in the ATM for cash uh, which was really nice and then suddenly uh, the exchange that uh, these ATMs are connected to said, OK, uh, you do your, you know, uh, AML checks and everything. Uh, it's all nice, uh, but we don't want you to buy or sell Monero in the ATMs uh, without, uh, you know, proving the identity of the of the buyer. So anonymous trades with Monero are not allowed. So this is an exchange that uh, you and I, uh, we can both send Monero to it and trade it because they know us, uh, we are verified. Uh, but especially for these companies that do services that have larger volumes, they uh, uh, the exchange told them, OK, we still want the business relationship with you, but don't use Monero, don't use Zcash as, as well. So. I think what will happen eventually is uh, that Monero will be the money that you, you know, uh, pay your uh, cleaning lady on the on the gray market, the money you pay for uh, you used to pay for your weed and <laughs> uh, uh, somehow illegal cons uh, consumption, uh, the the money you pay, you know. Uh, now even barbers are illegal <laughs> during lockdowns so so i think that this will become kind of a new version of cash so uh, and and i think it's quite nice because uh, if you use monero uh, and you know it's kind of shady uh, or bent even uh that there is uh, basically no expectation of the deal you know you are not going to ask for a receipt because you are you want to pay with monero <laughs> the other party wants to receive monero so you already have a shared understanding you are doing something a little bit shady uh shady i don't think that that you will uh that, that they will ban monero peer-to-peer -peer transactions i think it will be banned by exchanges but you know there is this understanding that okay maybe the company will not want to have monero on their books and so on so what i personally see is this divide bitcoin being for institutional investors you know savers above the board uh, super compliant maybe uh, with uh, transactions through lightning and monero will be uh, gray and black market so uh, peer to peer interactions you know sending money to to your friends you know someone pays for lunch uh, other people send him monero uh, and um, and you have this uh, uh, this dual system so bitcoiners always say okay there will only be one crypto it will all converge to bitcoin and all the all the shit coins will die and <laughs> and you know this is the story and it's always been like this um no actually there was uh, there was gold and silver standard and uh, silver was better for some things and uh, i think this can happen here that uh, there can be some some altcoin 
uh, my preference is obviously Monero because I care about privacy, but maybe there are even some, some other use cases where simply it is not feasible to, to use Bitcoin. Maybe the fees are too high. Maybe uh, when you pay your dealer, the dealer doesn't want to, you know, figure out if you KYC yourself or whatever, if your coins are clean and, and if they can pay their supplier, maybe they will just switch to something else. So I think this is a possibility. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess where we, my current, I think, uh, you, you, I guess you'll, you'll think this sounds uh, a little, a little maximalist uh, from the Monero point of view. I think it's all going to converge to Monero because it doesn't lack the flaw of not being fungible. And ultimately, you know, the regular, you know, uh, states coming down on it, potential bans. Um, I think if anything, those things would be short term. Uh, and I don't think what's your reasoning for how that would be implemented globally. Uh, you don't think there would be, you know, safe havens popping up where, you know, you would be able to freely more freely use your Monero. And then just the fact that at the end of the day, you know, Governments, uh, particularly the United States government, at the is is a democratic republic. Uh, mm -hmm. There is a constitute, supposedly a constitution that we're that we're supposed to be following. That's based on ideals, ultimately of liberty. You don't you think people are just going to stand by and uh, allow the United States government to essentially ban um, a communication network for communicating? Uh, you know value no no i don't i don't think this is how it's going to happen i think it will be uh, through ex exchanges and through uh comp companies not wanting to have it on their balance sheets so what i what i think is going to happen is that uh, coinbase and kraken and bitstamp they will all say we cannot you know comply we cannot verify our banking partners said that we need to know the history of the coins and uh, if we don't do it uh, they cancel our banking so we delisted monero so you can use it for peer-to-peer -peer trade uh, it's nice but uh, you're not going to be able to um to send into an exchange. So basically every uh, trade will have to be OTC. So peer to peer, which I don't mind. I, uh, I of course I like uh, liquid markets, but uh, uh, I, I like that people are returning to peer to peer trades. I, I think that's a very good development. And I see that happening also with Bitcoin and uh, also with, uh, with, uh, with lightning trades and, and with Monero as well. So, um, I don't think there will be a ban in a sense that uh, um, uh, that you cannot make a transaction or or this software is forbidden. But again, what what happened in Slovakia with the ATMs? You know, they had to de delist Monero even though they liked it. They personally, the the owners uh, had some Monero, but uh, they had to delist it because the exchange said, "Okay, we we cannot, you know." allow you to send us cash from random people and turn it into Monero, which we cannot uh, follow. And then uh, then our banking partners are asking us questions. And the same thing happened. Um, there are several companies uh, that were uh, making, uh, th they were selling uh, point of sale terminals. Uh, so, so merchants could uh, accept cryptocurrencies um, uh, and they would uh, uh, have an option to turn it into fiat for them, which is good, especially from the accounting point of view, because even if the, you know, you go to a restaurant, you pay your bill, uh, the accountant doesn't want to, you know, keep books of uh, your uh, $50 <laughs> uh, dinner payment and, you know, track the exchange rate and calculate tax on that. So for, for these kind of merchants, uh, uh, this this company these companies were uh, were selling it and sending them fiat. So for them it was like a credit card transaction. Basically they received fiat uh, on their account, but the, but they could accept uh, uh, crypto with these terminals. And they also had to delist Monero uh, because because of the exchanges. So uh, but there are. 
I'm sorry. Go ahead. Finish your thought. Yeah. Uh, there are uh, there are some restaurants that are actually keeping crypto and they still have the option to accept Monero. But for everyone else who wanted their crypto turned into fiat, uh, they had to delist it. And now you can pay with uh, Bitcoin, you can pay with Litecoin, uh, Bcash, whatever, but no Monero. So it's already happening uh, in a way. Now... But aren't exchanges going to be ir irrelevant? So, you know, in this future, people are still going to be transacting Monero peer to peer because it essentially can't be stopped. And, you know, I think we agree that governments, at least the United States, isn't going to take it to the point of trying to actually ban, ban it on a, on a protocol level. Um, mm -hmm. And those exchanges become irrelevant with, you know, decentralized exchanges, atomic swaps, why why do we even for us for, for us i hope uh but for institutions i think they're rather have bitcoin on their books uh, that is nice green mind <laughs> uh you know clean with known history preferably virgin coins you know right from the blog reward and um so so that's what i'm saying there will be this divide you know there will be this uh gray black peer-to-peer uh, -peer market uh, for Monero for us you know we can pay to our restaurant but you know Elon Musk is not going to buy Monero uh, Sailor is not going to buy Monero and uh, you know investment funds uh, are probably not going to buy Monero because what they what they want is a good ability to trade it in uh, in larger quantities so uh there you know they they need to see okay there is liquidity there is volume in this in this asset and uh i can i can just dump it on on an exchange if if i need it or if you know there's some kind of requirement from the shareholders and so on so yeah i think for us it's a really good uh, uh cryptocurrency uh i uh uh, maybe you don't know, I'm a co-founder of uh, Parallel Police, which is a, a place in uh, Prague and it was also shortly in Bratislava and uh, in uh, uh, there's one in Vienna. And we were trying to, uh, well, trying, we succeeded actually to create a, a place, a non-profit, a, a business uh, that accepts only crypto. So there was... Uh, and it's uh, like maybe six years old, so it was uh, it's it's quite old. Uh, we we run this uh, hackers congress uh, with a, with a lot of interesting crypto anarchist talks. We host Institute of Crypto Anarchy and so on. So we were playing with this. You know, we had uh, you know everyone who uh, came the front door and wanted a flat white uh, or or some other other coffee. Uh, they had to go through what we called uh, back then uh, uh, crypto torture or Bitcoin torture. Uh, in the beginning, we accepted only Bitcoin. So, okay, install a wallet or get a paper wallet. Uh, buy, uh, uh, there was an ATM, buy Bitcoin uh, with, your, with your cash, send it to your wallet, and you can pay with it. And... Uh, uh, we had, of course, all all the all the problems uh, of Bitcoin. 2017, one espresso uh, was uh, what three euros. Transaction fee was 50 euros, <laughs> or they paid <laughs> two euros, and we didn't get the money because it got kicked out of the mempool and so on. Uh, so we have uh, we have experienced and we have uh, uh, we have verified that it is possible to run quite a large it's it's a, a large house three three story building plus uh, plus a basement and now another building uh, so uh, there's a co-working space and so on and it's all running on crypto there is no fiat whatsoever no one employees get paid in crypto uh, suppliers uh, uh, when when they accept crypto otherwise we have to uh, trade it for cash and so on um, and of course when Monero uh, uh, was uh, when Monero had uh, actually uh, first uh, mobile wallets because you don't want to take out your laptop to pay for your coffee or for your co-working membership. Uh, 
we wanted to start accepting it uh, and we were experimenting with it and uh, started uh, uh, accepting uh, it on some other terminal now you can use btc pay server also with monero which i use successfully but the problem was that uh, people bought their first monero in an atm then they had to wait 20 minutes uh, uh, to get a coffee of course the barista would just give them the coffee and uh, they would pay later um so they uh, because because of these you know locked funds in in monero uh, they had to wait 20 minutes uh, until they could pay for their coffee uh, then they paid for their coffee uh, which was using one input uh, they drank their coffee and in five minutes they wanted a cake or another coffee or something else and they had to wait another 15 minutes until <laughs> their Monero is unlocked uh, and then they could pay. So uh, so there are some practical limitations on using Monero uh, as, a, as a payment system. And we have experienced it, you know, uh, it's very different when, uh, you know, uh, you and me geek out and talk about fungibility and so on and it's different when you have a 70 year old grandma from neighborhood who wants coffee in a nice place and uh, you kind of force her to go through all this and then you explain her that uh, in case of bitcoin you know sorry but the the fees are high so it's uh, you know 20 dollars today <laughs> or uh, you have to explain to her uh, sorry now you get got this new money of the future and now you have to wait 20 minutes until it's unlocked and you can actually use it so there are still i think some unsolved practical things that that you see when you when you do it day to day so for example cafeteria it's a it's a production line you know you are making one one espresso after another and then you have this queue of people <laughs> waiting for their coins to confirm and uh, it becomes fun so yeah uh, so yeah, there we, are challenges we, yeah no i totally get you there uh we're doing this so i don't we started something called gratuitous and mm -hmm. uh it's a company where, where coffee is the first product. We're selling coffee. We sell it online. And what's unique about it is when you buy the coffee, if you like the coffee, and hopefully you would, uh, you can send a tip to the farmers that farm the coffee. You can send them Monero. Wow, that's nice. Yeah, we get it from Guatemala. We went down to Antigua, mm -hmm. Guatemala. We got friendly with the, the, far, the, the owner of the farm. Mm -hmm. All the farmers, well, not all of them, but we met the, the 20 farmers that are there on a, on a daily basis. Uh, and we taught them about Monero and we gave them their own wallets. And uh, and now it's it's effectively working. We sell the coffee and we sell it in person as well. So I, I totally hear what you're saying. There are uh, there are some uh, issues there. Um, it's been working for us. I see what you're saying because people there, they were acquiring, acquiring their Monero at the time. They were then looking to go exchange it. So, yeah, I could see that yeah, potentially yeah. being an issue. Um, but, yeah, you know, I, I guess uh, everything has their trade offs. You know, I, I do think Monero uh, will continue, hopefully, to evolve to make, you know, being uh, something that's very useful for transactions. So, I do mm -hmm. think. You know that's very it much is, yeah. of the marrow ethos and it's it's proven yeah. to, to to have done a good job thus far and hopefully it'll only get better where do you um and yeah i i didn't know you, that you started that that's an amazing amazing what you guys are doing over there are you guys still running uh selling the coffee and have the cafe component as well so I live in Slovakia, so I, I haven't been in Prague for a while because of the lockdowns. It's a different country. Uh, I started, uh, well, I, I was part of the group that uh, that started it in Prague, uh, but I live in Bratislava. So I started another one in Bratislava, but we closed it like two weeks before the lockdowns because we saw, OK, this is going to be a horrible time. You know, we rather sell all, all our capital capital. Uh, buy crypto and wait and then uh, maybe reopen later we want to try it with shipping containers 
Um, but yeah, there, there is uh, coffee. I don't know if it's uh, right now open for public because uh, I don't know what's the uh, exact okay. lockdown situation in Prague. Uh, but I think the co-working space is slowly opening. There was a hacker, hackers congress, a conference in October, which was uh, like really the only week it could happen <laughs> during the year, ex well, after March. Um, so there was an online version. Uh, we had a, a few talks about Monero as well, and there was also in-person version. So, um, so yeah, it's it's happening. We also created a very interesting uh, project or or the Prague guys, um, uh, uh, which is called Decent Track, which is uh, a huge truck that has all the things uh, uh, kind of like a, a mini version of parallel police in a truck so you have an atm you have a coffee machine you have a, a projector st screen and you can bring it to music festivals to different cities and you can create like a demo version of parallel police so people can see if they kind of want it in their house i we hope that we inspire them to to start it physically in in their house um uh, in the in their city uh, and uh, uh, also what we are doing um, hopefully uh, probably next year because of the of the lockdowns is we want to build a modular one in uh, shipping containers so it's uh, also a very interesting project because you can have different access permissions and so on uh, and and you can expand you know with a with a physical space you want to try something new you you know you want to uh, for example we created a, a virtual reality arena uh, to play with uh, virtual reality you need a lot of floor space to do that because people are running around and you cannot expand your uh, your physical space but with shipping containers you buy a new one you put it in, on top of the existing one and you can you can expand easily so um uh, very uh, i i think that uh, it's going to be quite exciting one nice use case i wanted to uh, uh, tell you about uh, uh, what started happening in parallel police uh, uh, that uh, it, it um, uh, you reminded me about it uh, with with the farmers so um a lot of uh, um, I, I jokingly say that Parallel Police created a lot of crypto millionaires because they came there, they heard the talk, you know, they bought their first crypto, they forgot about it for five years, and now they're they're uh, rich. Uh, but what is more interesting is the poor people uh, or poorer people, and uh, we have seen a few of the. A uh, few of uh, homeless uh, guys uh, coming to uh, to Parallel Police, both in Prague and in Bratislava, and they they kind of uh, started talking to us. They were kind of shy, asking about you know, okay, can I buy this Litecoin or what has low fees or or Monero? Uh, I heard about it. Uh, uh, please confirm that I really don't need the bank account, and uh, you know, I can pay with cash and so on. So we we are kind of curious what is happening here. Like why 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 do these guys uh, really they coming from the street um, and they said that uh, uh, it is very difficult to declare bankruptcy it has a lot of uh, legal fees so basically uh, uh, they have a problem because uh, uh, because uh, any kind of money that they make uh, the state comes and takes it from them mm -hmm because uh, because they're in debt and they don't have money to get out of it through uh, declaring personal bankruptcy um so they kind of gave up they said okay uh, what's uh, like why should i work uh, if everything i make uh, the state takes from me and uh, use it uses it to to pay off my debt and uh, what the state cannot take it's written in the law is uh, one smartphone or one phone so one personal phone and clothes and you know some basic personal belongings they are still yours so they were asking questions like okay so if i buy this cryptocurrency and i protect my wallet with password is anyone at all able to take it from me and we said no and and we're really in in conversation with this uh, with these people and it it was very interesting uh, uh, and uh, they and they started doing it are they purchasing through ATMs or how they? Yes. How they... Yes. ATMs or or cash transactions. So, 
parallel so police is sometimes like a small trading floor you know someone yells oh i want to buy whatever monero bitcoin for 100 euros and uh, someone says okay i'm willing to do the trade and they do it uh, in person but the fees are very very low so i i think in bratislava the fees for buying crypto are 2.2 percent uh plus the network fee uh, which is uh, uh for things like litecoin it's 0 0.1 10 cents uh 10 euro cents so uh yeah they can really like the, the these were guys that came with 20 euro banknote and they said okay what should i buy uh so that the fees won't uh, eat it all um we didn't allow, uh, or the the uh, operator of the ATM didn't allow uh, buying uh, Bitcoin with less than fifty euros. So with twenty euros, you could buy back then Monero, Litecoin, and I don't know Dash or something like that. So most of them bought Litecoin. Uh, they were also interested in Monero uh, because uh, uh, because of uh, of privacy. But they really didn't care. What what they cared about is this is the money i earned and no one can take it from me and uh, right. this is an experience that they they, they yeah. didn't have in years so they okay i can i can save money wow i can i can buy a jacket i can you know i can start living again and uh, and kind of uh, do something with my situation and and they were not you know they they were not waiting it to go to the moon or anything they were really if i have this 20 euro will it still be there or some of it they understood the exchange rate but will i still keep this in six months yes perfect i want it <laughs> so that's a nice story i think no but yeah great you know great use case um you know revealing the the unconfiscatable uh that you know nature there of crypto which brings me so do you think you know if you were going to recommend to them uh, you know bitcoin or monero would, would the recommendation be monero for purposes of the fact that it's probably more unconfiscatable right so if you're going to acquire one of these through an exchange or an atm and you're worried about the state coming you know let's say you acquire a hundred dollars mm -hmm. of it and it turns into thousands of dollars and you have these debts that are owed uh they're going to want to i guess own Monero and not Bitcoin at that point, right? When it can be very well. The, the problem is that there is well that, that they had that they have that they have the crypto, and it's basically yeah. yeah. All right, I guess the government can't physically take it from them, but maybe effectively they can, right? By saying we know you have yeah. it, and if we see it move, then we know that you that you're using yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. On the other hand, you know these. Uh, I don't know what's the name for these enforcers. Uh, in in uh, Slovak, it's executors, but uh, that's <laughs> probably something else in English. So how do you, how do you, the, the collectors? Okay. Uh, the, the state collectors, you know, they're not that sophisticated, you know, they uh, they well, not work yet. with, yeah. not yet, uh, yeah. at least. So, no, they, they didn't care about this that much. Uh, so they even, you know, they, uh, they opened uh, Coinomi and it showed the balance. So, you know, we were way... <laughs> way in the in, in the much easier uh to understand uh, type of conversation you know no chain analysis and transparency you know can it be taken or not so the problem uh uh in the end uh was that uh that the uh, operator of the atm had to turn off monero so they couldn't buy it. so uh, most of them bought litecoin in the end because bitcoin has high fees and for them you know um uh, uh, paying uh, five ten euros or five or ten dollars for uh for a transaction fee is insane you know that <laughs> um with lightning it might be better but still it's the operator uh, had a turn off monero you said oh, for regulation purposes you're saying yeah because of the exchange that's what i was saying before that uh, that yeah. they had to take it off from from the point of sales the mm -hmm. one company or or two two companies i think and uh, also from the atms because the the exchange said okay you can sell anything but private coins uh and and the exchange uh, is still uh, they still have this trading pair they just say okay we cannot sell monero to an operator of an anonymous atm network that's that's we're not going to allow this so it's not delisted on the exchange but for some customers they 
uh, they just don't allow it. So so we had to we we didn't have a Monero. So we did a lot of uh, peer to peer trades uh, in Monero in the cafeteria because people were interested in it and. Um, I was sometimes uh, doing. A, um, I, um, I was. Uh, I was sometimes uh, working uh, as a barista there. Uh, when I when I had time, I, I really enjoyed it. Talking to people, making good coffee. You know, that's, uh, yes, that's yes. fun. And uh, like uh, more than a few occasions, someone came and asked, "Okay, can I pay with Monero or uh, can I buy Monero?" And oh, sure, yeah. <laughs> This is fun. Uh, also in Prague, uh, with uh, also with other baristas, it's very interesting that you can talk about crypto and about uh, the experience with crypto with the with the baristas, because they use it daily. You know, they 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 earn it. They have to kind of figure out what to do with the volatility. They need to uh, pay their rent uh, for, for their homes and, and so on. So these people, like, you know, uh, uh, they are not, you know, super geeks understanding uh, chain analyses and Schnorr signatures and <laughs> or ring signatures or, or things like that. Uh, but they live it every day, you know. It's not, uh, uh, not like, you know, these... Uh, 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 these uh, super theoretical, uh, uh, some you know, full node developers that pay their uh, every dinner with credit card and you know, a hodl on their wallet or something like that. These people use it every day. So, so this is why I I, I liked the environment because anyone you know, the artist, the uh, the the barista, the you know the designer of the furniture. Everyone had a personal experience uh, in uh, in earning Bitcoin and using it every day. And they 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 had to figure out uh, strategies how to uh, how to deal with uh, with volatility, how to decide when to save, when to uh, uh, when to spend it, and uh, and so on. So it's not this you know hodl attitude uh, you know i dollar cost average for a uh, hundred dollars every day and wait until i become rich no they had to every day you know do i uh, fill the uh, fill the tank of my car uh, today in this exchange rate or tomorrow <laughs> you know <laughs> can i wait or <laughs> when do i beat okay and uh, and um, also what we were doing uh, to make it a little bit easier uh, for them with with volatility was that we were paying them uh, often, like every day or every every three days and so on. So they could deal with uh, the volatility. We uh, we didn't uh, have the volatility risk. So because if you know customer pays us for coffee and Bitcoin or uh, whatever Monero uh, Litecoin drops 50%, we are screwed. There goes our profit margin. So what we did, we were uh, doing exactly the opposite what everyone else was doing. We were paying our suppliers immediately. We didn't want the coin to drop. <laughs> And they were doing it, you know. They were they were thinking about it. Okay, this is the money I need to pay for rent. So let's activate the trading floor and uh, exchange it to fiat and pay it. And now the rent is paid. Okay, I can maybe save something or so. So this is, uh, I think, very interesting that uh, part of crypto that you don't see in in many places that mm -hmm. people actually you know depend on it and use it every day if it doesn't work it's uh, you know uh, in 2017 we were accepting bitcoin and only bitcoin back then the, our, our point of uh, sale terminal di didn't understand every, anything uh, but bitcoin and you know uh, most bitcoiners said okay mempool is full sorry try in two weeks and i'm like okay we have cafeteria open people want to pay for espresso today we, they we, they don't have time to wait until uh, some people code uh, you know lightning network or, <laughs> or, right. or something yeah. else that we need to use it today to pay the, the two euros you know we don't have any other options we are not taking fiat so what should we do <laughs> and it's a kind of a different uh, story than uh, than these theoretical, you know. Uh... Yeah, yeah. What, I, what I'm finding, uh, what I'm finding with gratuitous is, 
you know, you, you we wouldn't be able to, like you're saying, you know, learning as we're using it, we wouldn't be able to even use Bitcoin uh, for the purposes of sending tips to Guatemalan farmers, right? So mm -hmm. we went down there, we gave them their paper wallets. A lot of these guys don't even have cell phones. They don't have computers. Yeah. Uh, one or two of them did, and they knew about crypto, and the hope is that, that those guys will teach it to the rest, keep them updated on everything. But at the end of the day, all we had to do was give them a piece of paper with 25 words on it, and now yeah. they, have, yeah. they have a key. You know, we wouldn't be able to do that with Bitcoin, uh, you know, because, you know, people can't send, you know, 10 cents. They can't send 50 cents. Yeah. Uh, not yeah. possible. And then, the you know, the it's very uh, people that are... So what we're doing, we, we are making, you know, pour overs for people. We're selling it on the street in Brooklyn. And like you said, it's mm -hmm. great. Everybody that we make a coffee for, we inevitably have a conversation about crypto and Monero and gratuitous. Mm -hmm. And so many people, pretty much all of them, except for, you know, you, you come across people that actually really know crypto. But by and far, most people, they don't even realize they know Bitcoin but they just don't know that it's not private. They just, it just blows their mind when you explain to them. And they're like, mm -hmm. oh, I thought that's what it was. I thought that's what the whole thing was. And yeah, CNN wrote that people are buying drugs with it. So, <laughs> right. So, there <laughs> has to be private. <laughs> a lot of misinformation out there. And, you know, their eyes open and they, they immediately get excited about Monero. And they say, oh, also, you, you can't even send, uh, you know, the Guatemalan farmer 50 cents of Bitcoin right now because, you know, it costs $50 to send a transaction. They're like, wait, what? And, you know, they, that once again, their, their, their eyes light mm -hmm. up. Uh, and one of the unique things we've been doing too is um, offering people change in Monero. So they'll, mm -hmm. they'll pay, you know, buy a $4 coffee, give us a $10 bill in cash. And we say, would you like your change back in Monero as a way to onboard them? So mm -hmm. um, we're Smart. doing but the, but the real world, I, I totally uh, get what you're saying, and we've been experiencing that ourselves. We'd love to talk to you more about that. We can talk offline. Maybe there's a, yeah. a way we could provide gratuitous coffee for you guys, you know? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, and uh, it's exciting. It's exciting to see some people, somebody sent, uh, you know, because they, they told us somebody sent a, a $90 tip to the farmers, you know? So it's real money, mm -hmm. and it's it turned into quite a bit for you know for these guys that are making 10 bucks a yeah. day and we're hoping to scale wow. up the idea where it's not just coffee farmers but you know we could add olive oil we could add you know i mean the, the possibilities are endless you know any, any product yeah. people are essentially underpaid for the, for the end product give, give there is there is also a guy uh in parallel police uh, who had a, pro a project in uh, cameroon in, in Africa, uh, they were uh, making uh, honey, so so some some kind of local honey and some other kinds of products, and uh, he was also paying them in Monero. So he actually had, uh, I, I think he has some some guy down there who handles the uh, the Monero to fiat if they need it and and so on, but. Uh, also he's like because what are you going to wire uh you know us dollars to to cameron you know the even just just the fee would be uh huge and you know then then the uh the state would want to confiscate part of it because you know people are earning money from abroad you know that's uh that's a honeypot <laughs> basically for for stealing their money so with monero this works uh really good and i i've been buying um, uh, a few of my groceries actually with monero from from these guys they they do olive oil also honey and uh, uh some uh, some cheese and uh, some farmers pro products so yeah. this is a really good idea i i totally like what what you're doing and uh, i definitely think it should be expanded it's cheap it's private you know no one knows how much you earned so uh tax uh, is optional <laughs> and uh it's uh it's a great thing to do so i mean i could talk to you for hours i don't know how much time you have because i mean you you are um a wealth of information i've been listening obviously reading your your, your blog posts um but listening to your podcast i don't know how new that pot but it's great it's amazing i don't know uh if you Thank have you. 
thousands of followers yet there, but you should. Nope. It <laughs> that, you know, you see, you know, not to you know, insult anybody, but you see, you know, the tone vases of the world and these guys that talk about price and they have hundreds of thousands of, uh, you know, followers, right? And uh, yeah. somebody like you who understands this technology so well uh, and is in it for the right reasons. I love when you're speaking about liberty and um, I listened to one of your podcasts where you basically uh, explained your your personal, I guess, manifesto, right? On, on yeah, what, yeah. It is you, what it is you most fundamentally care about. Do you want to get into that? Would you like to talk about that a little bit? Sure, 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 sure. So, so the podcast is called Option Plus, and that's also the mani manifesto. So, for there are many definitions of liberty, and one of them is increasing your options. So that's where the name comes from. So, and how how would you describe your, you know, your your personal belief in in liberty, your personal manifesto, mm -hmm. so to speak? Uh, what is what is your personal manifesto? If you, if you don't mind. All right. Uh, so uh, I think that, uh, uh, well, me personally, I was a libertarian, not politically libertarian, but uh, uh, but my values are are based on the values of liberty uh, for a long time. And uh, usually, what happens, and it's, this also ties to the philosophy of parallel police, why we why we started it, this place in Prague. Uh, uh, there are basically a few ways how you can increase your liberty. So, uh, of course, uh, elections doesn't work for me. Uh, too, too much energy, uh, too little result. <laughs> uh, you can do revolutions, which are usually violent, very expensive. Uh, you know, uh, you need to convince others to uh, basically uh, live under a different set of values than, than they have. And uh, at some point, I realized that it doesn't make sense for me to force my values uh, onto other people. So I said, OK, um, we as a as a parallel community, parallel police community, which is involved in crypto, but also in other things like parallel education, parallel trade, parallel um, uh, marriages even which is also also a funny uh, and interesting topic um, we need to increase our options increase our liberty without convincing everyone else around us because they don't care they want their you know they want their social security paychecks they want to vote they have their own values and we are a minority. We are we are not going to convince fifty percent of people that uh, you know low taxes, privacy, and uh, uh, these things are something they want. No, they want presence. They want they want their life. That they there's a lot of inertia. Uh, they're they're uh, basically. Uh, wouldn't say happy, but they cannot imagine another kind of wor world where uh, where there is uh, so much liberty that no one will take care of them so i said uh, and and we uh, were this uh, we were talking about this a lot of course and uh, we decided that we want to create some form of parallel society either where we live or crypto anarchy which is basically parallel society uh, on the internet somehow you know connected people with their pseudonyms their identities trading uh, with a common set of values uh, crypto anarchy is very libertarian philosophy and uh, the place itself parallel police is kind of combination of these two ideas so parallel police um, was a strategy uh, during the communism in czechoslovakia when when they realized that they're not going to overthrow the communist regime uh it's going to be there you know they don't have manpower uh you know uh, the communists have a lot of guns they have jails they they can really be uh intimidating uh, and they can you know basically ruin your life uh so one of these guys uh, i'll just cut the story short but one of these guys said okay so we cannot change this regime not today uh, uh, you know it's been here for 
decades and we just don't have enough power to do this. But what we can do is we can create this uh, parallel society that will be uh, strictly uh, limited to people who share the same values based on liberty. And we will do everything that the state requires from us. So we will comply with uh, like a minimal set of uh, their requirements uh, in order not to go to jail. But then we need to find a way how to live our lives. So in practice, what, what it was doing. So for example, you had children, you had to send them uh, to uh, state school, which was teaching Marxism, Leninism and all this, you know, socialist bullshit. And uh, if you didn't send them there, uh, uh, they they would take uh, take the children from you because it was mandatory. So of course, no one wants their kids taken from there from them. But what you could do is you can say, okay, after school, 6 p.m. every Thursday in the kitchen of this guy, there is a parallel school, and we will teach Western democracy or uh, whatever. Uh, uh, economy or <laughs> uh, English or anything that you couldn't learn from school. Then they realized, okay, um, normally trade is permitted within the state uh, uh, state approved uh, shops. There's no private entrepreneurship. Everything is state owned. But if we meet in this kitchen for the school, we can also trade among each other. You know, you have apples. Uh, someone else has. Uh, carrots and and people can trade so this is the the philosophy of not changing the whole world uh, but still living a free life in a way but you you have to build it you have to build these communities so parallel police is the name of this uh, philosophy police is not uh, cops but uh, it's from greek meaning city or uh, the uh, the smallest uh, societal unit. So it was not actually uh, only cities, but also villages or, or, or communities. So th this is about parallel communities. And when we started it, we realized that crypto anarchy is basically this parallel community, but not, not in someone's kitchen, not in a black house in Prague, uh, but uh, in a, uh, on the internet where uh, you don't have your physical body that can be coerced and put to jail. Uh, you can use pseudonyms, you can trade, you can exchange information, uh, you can find new friends, and uh, you can live parts of your life uh, in this parallel community. But if you have to, you can still go to your normal job, you can still, you know, pay taxes on whatever the, the state sees and so on. So this is uh, where my philosophy, my personal philosophy comes from. Uh, is the, uh, I value liberty, I want to increase it in my life, but I don't have time for uh, political campaigns and, you know, uh, convincing others that they want something that actually I want and they maybe don't. So. Uh, so we are finding ways how to increase uh, uh, increase liberty. And uh, cryptocurrency is a, an amazing tool for that. Uh, you can uh, f maybe maybe you don't uh, uh, you don't know, uh, but um, uh, people were uh, doing um, offshore business for a long time, you know, uh, corporations in Panama and so on. What many people don't realize is that the actual regulations didn't change much. So you can still start uh, an LLC in Seychelles that pays zero tax. You can still, uh, you know, uh, run your business from from Panama City where uh, where there's territorial taxation. So uh, foreign income is zero percent. What doesn't work is. Uh, financial transactions because the the second you receive uh your uh, uh your coins from a from a uh, Seychelles company uh, there is alert to the tax office and uh, you cannot actually do that do this you cannot actually trade it unless you use crypto so this really increases your options there are many other things uh, uh, I'm uh, mentioning Panama. I'm a, I'm a Panamanian resident now, which 
proved to be very useful during lockdowns because the borders were closed uh, for tourism but i just wave my residency card and say oh dear customs i'm going home i'm not a tourist <laughs> i live there uh, so they let me through i could go to the airport and i could go whenever i want so all these things that you experiment with i didn't know i would use my panama residency panamanian residency like this but all these things that you try in your life to increase your options to uh, to rent to be more flexible to uh, to use uh, crypto to use uh, encrypted communication uh, to get out of employment and kind of start being uh, uh, a micro entrepreneur to uh, to not even have employees but uh, interact with people uh, from the community who have the same values as you so you know that if you agree on a contract it's going to happen if it's not going to happen you know how you're going to solve the dispute you know you have all these uh, tools that we expect from from mainstream society but we don't need these tools from them and i didn't know uh, when we were when we were start starting with this i didn't know how we are going to do this how we are going to uh to make use of all these experiments so uh panamanian residency is uh, ten thousand uh, dollars and when i was doing it i thought okay i'm wasting ten thousand dollars to get a stupid state card <laughs> with my photo <laughs> that is basically useless you know i didn't change my tax residency so i didn't do it for taxes i still have uh, have tax residency in slovakia so so it's it was an experiment i didn't know if it's useful and i found out that it can be useful you know you can use it to open uh, an account on a panamanian crypto exchange which is not reporting uh, because they only uh, take panamanian residents so they didn't uh, build interfaces for reporting because they don't have anyone to report to they only take panamanians so uh, this is kind of maybe betting on serendipity or something like this you are just uh, trying things out that lead in a good way uh, hope for an upside and it somewhat sometimes comes and in the end you end up with more liberty than you started with without political campaigns without elections convincing everyone around so uh, that's uh, that's <laughs> that's the version <laughs> of uh, of my manifesto uh, wow that was a long monologue <laughs> <laughs> It's uh, it's an important one though. It's an important one, and uh, I I I agree with you. You know, your manifesto. I, th I think we I think we share uh, that manifesto. Um, good, good. It's 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 how I found my way to Monero. I, I ran I ran for Congress here in the in the in the U.S. Wow. Here. So yeah, well aware of of your criticisms there too of of trying to go the political route and. A big part of why I ran is to, uh, you know, potentially protect Monero if need be, protect cryptocurrency, mm -hmm. uh, mostly Monero because, like we're saying, you know, that that one seems to be more under attack than than the others. Um, and so, yeah, liberty is at my core. It's what drives me. So, you you. You painted uh, what I think is probably a pretty, you know, uh, accurate or likely picture of the future in terms of Bitcoin and Monero, or at least, you know, maybe for some period of time that will exist. Is that what you want to see? I mean, what, what, what's what's your ideal version? I mean, do you want do you want a world where we're all uh, where we're all transacting with Monero as opposed to, you know, Bitcoin being the thing that corporations uh, are using. Would you rather see a purely Monero world? Um, if I have to choose, I, uh, I would say I would prefer to let people decide uh, what they want to transact with. I don't... I, as I said, I, I personally own also Bitcoin, so I have skin in the game there and I don't want anything bad to happen to, to Bitcoin either. I think it's a, it's a wonderful invention and I, I think it has good sides, uh, especially with the, uh, with the 
uh, default answer of no to every change. I think that's something that you can you can build on. Uh, with Monero, I I like it. I I use it uh, quite often actually uh, in the in the community um, uh, that I'm part of. We uh, you know we settle small debts with it. We we send it to each other. We we trade with it so so i like it i i, I use it uh, almost as much as bitcoin so uh right now i'm actually uh experimenting with lightning quite a lot so so i might be doing more lightning transactions than than monero transactions uh, right now but we still use it all the time so i don't uh, I don't want to force uh, my opinion on anyone. I, I think it's perfectly fine if people want to buy Bitcoin and uh, be invested in it. Uh, I recommend having some Monero just in case, like it's uh, uh, just in case something happens to Bitcoin, just in case you need it for anything, uh, you know, to be a little bit more untraceable, a little bit more fungible. There might come situations in life when, uh, when, you want such a thing as a as an um, untraceable fungible currency. I think uh, not only uh, because of the uh, uh, the homeless uh, cases. Uh, I personally don't have any debt, so uh, so that's not a problem for me. But uh, there might be situations when when it's useful. So I I don't. Uh, like my ideal vision is definitely not one particular cryptocurrency winning and all all the others going to zero or being banned or being useless. I I think uh, I'm quite open uh, and uh, and uh, I'm happy that uh, uh, these uh, uh, these projects are interacting. Like there's a lot of uh, good research about Bitcoin from the Monero community, especially about fungibility. You know, the article uh, by by Seth Simmons uh, with the fungibility graveyard uh, of Bitcoin. You know, it's it's a contribution to Bitcoin. Uh, samurai people are working on atomic swaps. They also uh, care about privacy. So I I I would say. Uh, more cooperation and more interaction is uh, much better than anyone winning of course except of the state i don't like cooperating with them <laughs> it's a for me it's a waste of time i i i don't have any any good uh, use case for uh, for doing that i tried in the in the past but the, it's not you potentially seeing Bitcoin, what it's becoming, being at odds with your core values. So, you know, compliant mining, right? It's happening. Uh, you see yeah. it. We, we, we basically see, you know, I think agree that Bitcoin uh, is becoming more of this, you know, uh, digital, clean digital property uh, that people can own and store their value in. But is it liberating or potentially uh is there some a potential dystopia scenario there uh where you know it it can as we it can very easily be mass surveilled um mm -hmm. and yes you, you your key you hold your keys uh nobody else has your crypto um but if you know your value is known by others uh you know whether it's your neighbor or the state um mm -hmm. are you potentially losing liberty in those scenarios where it may feel like you've opted out of the system but you've really just opted into something that's controlled in a different way yeah i would say it's going to be very difficult to use for people who don't understand it security or the the it aspect of it the computer science aspect of it uh because most people have no clue you know how it's uh, uh, how it's stored on the chain and what how can it be surveilled uh, even those who have seen uh, blog explorer they don't understand that that there is this uh, second layer uh, from from the chain analysis companies that that is kind of this information that uh, companies and governments pay for and and uh, it is 
much richer in uh, in the uh, in what what kind of information is there. So normally you see a transaction from one address to another, and uh, if you add the chain analysis layer, you see okay, this is Uri withdrawing. Uh, bitcoin from his kyc account on this exchange and, and they're exchanging this information it's uh you don't see it but uh whoever pays uh, does so uh, yeah i think that uh, uh that uh, this is definitely a problem uh and it's it's not uh uh it doesn't uh, i would say comply with my with my uh values on the other hand, uh, before uh, doing Bitcoin, I was a gold bug. I, I liked uh, hard money and I really like that uh, uh, that there is uh, even uh, even more predictable uh, uh, currency with supply that has uh, 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 with uh, fixed uh, fixed supply, kept supply um, that has a pretty good infrastructure. So uh so one thing that uh, that you can do is uh, 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 there are all these uh, decentralized uh, uh, exchanges especially derivatives exchanges what you can do if you want uh, to make use of this bitcoin number go up technology uh, and still use monero is what uh, you can actually um uh, hedge uh, the value of your of your Monero uh, to Bitcoin with some kind of perpetual swap trade. Right now, you are probably going to pay some fees for it. But what you can do is you can say, okay, I want to use this NGU aspect of Bitcoin, uh, and I want uh, it to be backed on chain in my Monero wallet. So this uh, is right now it's not so easy you can do it without uh, kyc on some some derivatives exchanges uh, but uh what is great about bitcoin is the the infrastructure collateralized loans you know uh, derivatives uh, atms uh, and so on so i think uh, that we can still use it it's still not uh, taken over by the by the state by the regulators and by the by the financial system so what i would like to be able to do is okay maybe i cannot take uh, uh take uh, uh uh cash out of atm by selling uh, monero because it's not there but i can swap it from litecoin or uh, uh, uh through litecoin or lightning or or anything else it's not my own chain transaction i don't care about it it comes from from an exchange so uh so what i can do is use my monero by swapping it to lightning bitcoin sending it to an atm and withdrawing cash if i need it so i think that there is a lot of uh, uh a lot of cooperation possible between between these systems and i think it's a good thing that they are divided that the bitcoin is becoming kind of this super compliant thing no one uh, is going to see the sketchy or uh, you know money laundering tool or something like that you can still use your monero and uh, use these services to go in and out and and use it so of course uh, if uh, uh, if monero uh, uh, had this infrastructure it would be also also good um, but you don't have some things uh, for example with uh, lightning you have streaming payments uh, uh, not with monero but if you can you know use your monero to uh, buy a lightning channel without your utxo you don't care you know what's the where where does the money come from you just swap it uh, let's say with an atomic swap and you can use this infrastructure so i i personally see uh, there is more value and uh, uh, also it conforms to my personal values to when these projects cooperate and we we can use best of everything even even if bitcoin goes the you know uh, to the dark side and is uh, super compliant and uh, you know every coin has a history and a story to tell <laughs> about uh, about his owner <laughs> um, 
uh, it's it's still i think um, i think good that we have uh, have this uh, ecosystem that it's not uh, only only one coin so uh, i don't mind bitcoiners i'm happy that they're working on the project maybe they will even solve this problem somehow i i personally don't see how but uh, maybe they they'll figure something out maybe there will be enough miners that say no we are not not censoring transactions we don't care that you put it on the blacklist and uh, uh, this could actually happen with iran have you uh, have you seen the the tweet uh, uh, or the the information uh, yesterday from the iranian central bank they uh, they said that the only legal uh, cryptocurrencies in Iran are those that were mined in Iran. So yeah. the reverse yeah. <laughs> transaction, you know. So uh, so uh, if Iran coins are being uh, 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 being uh, put on the sanction list because it's uh, i think it's still sanctioned country by by us it's not by europe so i i, I don't know if i'm not saying it correctly but i i think us still sanctions iran so what could happen is actually the iranian miners could be the ones that are super non-compliant and they don't care about the <laughs> the list because they're on it anyway so it's there's uh, like why not collect the the transaction fees from the uh, uh from the sanctioned transactions it's no difference to them because they're going to be sanctioned anyway <laughs> uh so maybe this will happen i don't know uh i i i painted the darkest picture because i think we need to think about the worst case scenarios but it can it can still be be okay and i hope for that yeah that was uh, those those are great thoughts too yeah i guess we'll have to see how that how that shakes out with the mining. So what what is your your current take on it? Just so we're clear because I I want anybody tuning in, I know they they a lot of people were very interested in, in those blogs you wrote. Um has have your thoughts evolved a little bit there then? Uh do you do you think it's likely that there's go that compliant miners are going to take over or I guess what odds are you attributing to it? Uh I don't like odds. That's uh, the margin of error is uh, higher than <laughs> than uh, uh, than the uh, information value in there. But I think it's it's definitely likely. I I wouldn't rule it out. I don't see anything happening that would uh, that would rule it out. And I think uh, what I said that uh, uh, that the the states and the regulators and the banking system they have spent a lot of energy on making sure that this anti money laundering program is uh, is happening and they don't want uh, anything to slip around it so i think they will push really hard uh, and they're not as stupid as many libertarians think the the states uh, the politicians are not usually the smartest people on the planet but they uh, the people who are thinking about these regulations and implementing them they're definitely not stupid so i wouldn't say okay uh it's not going to happen be because these people don't have the mental capacity to understand bitcoin mining or something like that uh, i i don't think that is uh, that is uh, probable on the other hand uh, i see a lot of uh, pure crypto anarchists uh, uh, with good values running mining pools uh, running miners so maybe uh, maybe uh, they will not care about uh, uh, about uh, being put on a blacklist and they would do it uh, for uh, for the for the values and uh, i know that there is a czech mining pool um uh, originally slash pool I, I think it's still actually called slash pool but the company uh, is called brains now um and they're building the stratum 2 protocol which allows the miners themselves the end miners to construct the blocks so the pool only controls the reward address but uh, uh, but the blocks are actually created by the by the miners so maybe there will be 
one percent two percent of miners that uh, that will mine these transactions and uh, uh, and maybe uh, there will not be a good way to enforce uh, um, uh, the fact that if you follow a block with sensor transactions then your coins are also tainted maybe this is not how it will uh, work in practice because it's a like from the uh, from their justification point of view, it's a very different case to make because uh, the miner that follows uh, uh, a block with uh, with sanctioned transactions, he's not making money on those transactions. It's not part of his block reward, so he's not. Uh, they're not uh, uh, profiting on laundering money. They just uh, created a new block that has nothing to do with the previous one. Just refers to it. So maybe this is how how it will end. Maybe we will have one two percent of hash rate uh, uh, not censoring and others just going along with it and uh, playing nice. Maybe they would just say, "Okay, uh, we don't care. We uh, we just do." Uh, uh, we just uh, comply with the regulations we will not include it but let others include it if if they if they want so honestly i don't know i think the worst thing that can happen was explained and it's pretty dark <laughs> dark and you also uh, uh, i heard uh, uh, i think one of your videos where where you explained why why this is a problem as well uh, but uh, uh, but anything can happen and i'm not uh, I'm not cheering for the for the dark side. <laughs> I uh, I I think uh, even even if we you know don't uh, don't uh, let uh, Bitcoin fail, I think there's still good use cases for Monero even today. So we don't need Bitcoin to be this you know dystopian hellhole in order for Monero to succeed. I uh, I can see many of its use cases today, uh, and it can do many things that Bitcoin cannot do even today. So even if you're a monero maximalist <laughs> i don't think that you need uh, to you know uh cheer and wait for for this uh, dystopia to happen and uh, i think that there are still good use cases for monero anyway all right Jiraj, thank you so much man thank you for, for your thank time thank you thanks for i, thanks I know for we me. here but i i really want to to drain your brain here i want i want you to <laughs> spill it all out i appreciate it I appreciate yeah happy it. to all right we'll come be... visit us to europe to parallel police and institute of crypto anarchy it's a fun place 100%, to be 100 percent. i was gonna go a few years ago and uh for whatever reason it didn't happen uh but i will definitely make my way there at some point 100 good good let me all know right. i'll show you around okay thank you <laughs> nice chatting with you man we'll be in touch Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much and we look forward to being back next week.